November 20th, 1614, London. The English crown has arrested one of the most notorious pirates of the age, Samuel Palachi, a man called both merchant and diplomat in Morocco, called rabbi in Amsterdam, called pirate and heretic in Madrid. Now, it's not disputed that he did take two Spanish vessels returning from the New World. What's at issue is whether he did so as a licensed privateer or a pirate. The Spanish ambassador calls for him to be hanged, British barristers rush to his defense, and a letter from Prince Maurice of the Dutch Republic requests his release. Wait, wait, hold on a minute. Who exactly does Samuel Palachi work for? Thanks so much to Ting Mobile for helping us tell this historic tale loud and clear. Samuel Palachi was a rabbi, a pirate, a merchant, a diplomat for the Sultan of Morocco, a spy, and the founding member of the first Jewish minyan, or worship group, in Amsterdam. Or maybe not, because Samuel Palachi was a supremely adaptable figure, talented at playing one side against the other, being whoever his patrons wanted him to be, and through entangling his life. We can glean a huge amount of insight on the legal status of Jews in 17th century Europe. Palache was born sometime around 1550 in the Jewish quarter of Fez. The child of a rabbi, his parents had been forced out of southern Spain in 1492 and took refuge along with other Sephardic and Morocco refugees in the Sultanate of Morocco. While things were hard for these Jewish refugees, and they were vulnerable to mob violence from their Moroccan neighbors, by the time Palache was born, the Jewish community was established and prosperous. Many Jews served on the Moroccan court, where they were seen as more loyal because they had no blood ties to rival families. And Iberian Jews possessed skills that the Moroccan sultans appreciated. Being neither Christian nor Muslim, they made the perfect middlemen in both trade and diplomacy. Also, they were experienced in merchant shipping and spoke multiple languages, having held on to their Spanish as well as learning Arabic, French, English, Italian, and Dutch. They were between, between cultures, between nations, between religions. And that's the space where Samuel Palachi would learn to operate. He attended Jewish schools, learning the Torah and the merchant trade, a religious education unavailable to Jews living in secret in the rest of Europe. These credentials would cause the Jews of Amsterdam to call him rabbi, which at the time was a title for any scholar of religious learning. So while he wasn't ordained, he did become a merchant and court figure, a Spanish Jew born in Morocco serving the Sultan. And then things went sideways. In 1603, the sultan died, and his two sons entered a bloody civil war, with one taking the north and the other the south. And as if that wasn't enough, a plague wiped out a third of the population. Morocco's Jewish community saw their previous security disappear. And like so many others, Balaji decided to flee. To Spain. Oh, yeah, you heard me right. A generation before, they'd fled Spain for Morocco, and now they were fleeing back. Because a lot can happen in a hundred years. The Europe of 1603 was entirely different from that of 1492. The Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Counter-Reformation had spurred 80 years of uprisings and religious wars that butchered hundreds of thousands. Many European nations were so exhausted by the combat that their governments started believing that minority religions, including Judaism, weren't a problem as long as they were worshipped privately. So while you couldn't build a synagogue, you could pray and celebrate holidays without much fear of state prosecution. Even the Spanish Inquisition, though it still arrested and sentenced conversos, mostly had their hands full hunting Protestants. So Sephardic Jews, including Samuel and his brother Joseph, went to Spain. But they did so under the official auspices of the Sultan of Morocco, who before he died gave the pair 15,000 pounds of beeswax and sent them to Lisbon to trade it for jewels. And they were still there two years later, having decided to settle after their mission was complete. And to convince the Spanish to let them stay, the pair secretly offered to develop a plan to capture a port town on the Moroccan coast. They even got an allowance and the right to settle if they converted. So now to recap, two Spanish Jews serving the Moroccan Sultan, now secretly serving the King of Spain against Morocco, and pledging to convert to Christianity. Got it. That is, of course, until the Spanish wouldn't give them more money, and they tried to unsuccessfully sell some of Spain's royal correspondence to France. And I mean, who hasn't been there, right? Right about then, the Inquisition got interested in the brothers, and they were forced to hide in the French ambassador's house for months before smuggling themselves to Amsterdam, which was a friendly city for Jews. See, the Netherlands had once been part of Spanish Habsburg holdings, but had thrown that off in the wars of religion and declared themselves the Dutch Republic, a state that believed in religious tolerance. 
Palachi made some contacts there and finally went back to Morocco to report to his employer Zidane Abumali, the southern sultan in the north-south split. And he arrived right as Morocco was putting together a mission to the Dutch Republic in order to discuss a trade relationship that would align the two countries against Spain. So while his brother managed family affairs, Palachi signed on as a translator. So to keep all this straight again, he's a Spanish Jew serving the Sultan of Morocco, selling secrets to Spain and a representative to the Dutch. Right? We got all that, Zoe? Ah, there it is. You're Moroc, buddy. Arriving in The Hague, he befriended Prince Maurice of Nassau, the leader of the Dutch Republic, and after months of negotiations, hammered out an agreement. The Treaty of Friendship and Free Commerce, the first treaty between a North African kingdom and a European state. Now, what was being exchanged? Guns. Lots of guns. Morocco sent spice, diamonds, and sugar in exchange for Dutch cannons, muskets, and gunpowder so Zidane could finally reunify the country. And it seems Palace was making these deliveries himself. But he also got another thing out of the alliance. Secrets. Secrets about the Dutch he could pass to Morocco. Secrets from Morocco he could pass to the Dutch. Information on both he could sell to Spain, and information on Spain he could sell to both. Prince Maurice also outfitted a small naval force for him, so that he could attack Spanish shipping. But since the Dutch had a treaty with Spain, Palace would operate under a privateering license from Sultan Zidane. Okay, so final allegiance tally, I think. He's a Spanish Jew, sailing a Dutch ship with a crew of Barbary Corsairs, Jews, and Dutch sailors who are plundering Spanish shipping while under the Moroccan flag, while he's also selling everyone's secrets to everyone else. Oh, and Rob tells me he had a kosher cook aboard just to throw that in for color. We good? Y you got all that? Oh boy. Palachi kept up the privateering for years, but his luck turned in 1614, when he captured two Spanish ships that were returning from the New World. Smashed up by a storm on the way back to the Dutch Republic, he made port in England, where he had a safe conduct agreement, only to be arrested at the insistence of the Spanish ambassador. The ambassador built a case that Palachi was a Spanish subject, having applied for residence and converted to Christianity. He wanted Palachi to hang. And it might have happened. Except Prince Maurice sent a letter to King James of England, protesting the arrest and asserting that Palachi was not a pirate, but a privateer licensed by the Republic's ally, Morocco. The result was that Palachi was in complicated legal limbo, but treated like a diplomat rather than a pirate. He lived in the Lord Mayor's house and took sightseeing trips about town, at one point finding himself head-on with the Spanish ambassador's carriage and forcing it off the road. Then, when Palachi's day before the Privy Council came, he won on all points. He was a licensed privateer with a safe conduct agreement, and the English lawyers admitted that to execute him would violate international law. Then, when the Spanish ambassador protested that England had sided with a Jew over fellow Christians, one barrister remarked that Spain itself didn't see a difference. It burned Jews and Englishmen just the same. Ironically, a few months later, Palache would approach that same Spanish ambassador through an intermediary, offering to sell secrets. Whether he needed the money or intended to be a double agent, we'll never know, for Palache fell ill and died in 1616. Prince Maurice himself marched in his funeral procession, followed by the entire Jewish community of Amsterdam, whom he'd helped foster with his education and by donating books. A Jewish man with Spanish blood, born and raised in Morocco, and buried as a hero in the Netherlands. A death as complicated as his life. But he wasn't the only Jewish pirate in the Dutch Republic. So join us next time for the tale of Moses Cohen Henriquez as he pulls a heist against the Spanish treasure fleet and pals around with Henry Morgan. Though of course you should never feel like you have to resort to something like piracy on the high seas to pay for anything, especially your phone bill. Which is why we're excited to welcome back today's sponsor, the new and improved Ting Mobile. Now, I don't have to tell you how expensive cell phone bills can be. In fact, a few months ago, I looked at mine and realized if Zoe's treat budget was to be maintained, I needed to find a solution. Then Ting came to the rescue, and I cut my phone bill in half. And I'm not the only one. Our studio director, Jeff, has been keeping a tally of all of the money he saved by switching to Ting for his family's two phones and an iPad. Where are we at, Jeff? Whoa, that is a lot of treats. 
And that savings is because you can choose the plan that's right for you. With their Flex plan, you get unlimited talk and text for just $10 a month. Then only pay $5 a gig for data when you use it, which is great because Wi-Fi is everywhere these days. They also have their Set 5 plan for $25 a month, which includes 5 gigs up front for if you know you're going to be on the move. And for you hardy travelers, there's the unlimited talk, text, and data plan for just $45 a month. So you can keep up with all of your content on the go. Plus, switching is super easy. Just head to extracredits.ting.com to check your phone's compatibility, then create an account and pick a plan that's right for you. Oh, and when you bring your phone and use our link, you also get a $25 service credit to try Ting with no strings attached. They'll send you a SIM card you pop in your phone, and you'll be saving some cash, helping support our channel, and be up and running in no time. That's right, Zoe. Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One are fantastic legendary patrons. Thank you.